Good evening. My name is John Powell. I'm the director of the Othering and Belong Institute. What you don't know is that I went to school with Alicia's mom and dad. Uh, and I um, haven't seen them in many years, but she's all grown up. <laughs> so it's late. We're not going to keep you long. Uh, but I did want to have a chance for, uh, to ask a few questions. Um, and while they're getting settled, let me just share with you. There's a nice, uh, first of all, I want to thank Mina for all the work you've done, uh, Zellerbach, and all of you for coming out. But I also want to just thank, this was like a gift. Uh, and <laughs> you know, people were learning, people were crying, people were laughing. Uh, the whole country should see this. So thank you. Um, I, one of my favorite writers is James Baldwin. And he says, and, and it's interesting, especially here at Berkeley, and I'll just tell you why in a minute. Uh, well, I'll tell you why now. Uh, Berkeley is the epicenter of the disability center in the country. And we have a lot of students here who are disabled. Berkeley is also proud to have a lot of Pell Grant students, which means students who are going to college for the first time. And they often come to me and say, how do we fit in? And when we think of migration, it makes me think of that. And what Baldwin says is, the place in which I'll fit will not exist until I make it. Um, my family, like probably many black families, were part of the Great Migration. Can you repeat that quote? Yes, it says, the place in which I will fit will not exist until I make it. Mm. In some ways, I feel like, you know, you think about migration, and the whole human race has been migrating, migrating out of Africa all over, looking for a place to fit. And people get relatively comfortable. Uh, but for African Americans, the truth of the matter is we have not gotten comfortable. My family migrated to Detroit, and now half of them are back in the South. Um, and you talked about that in terms of the narration. The migration, Isabel's wonderful book, The Warmth of, uh, the Warmth of Other Suns, the migration is not over. It's not over. So one of the questions I have is, are you guys thinking about a sequel? <laughs> are you going to help us think about the migration in the 21st century? Um, so I don't know if either one of you want to speak to that, but you might, your families have migrated. Like I said, I know Carol and Ira. Um, yes. What's next? Well, Jason migrated to New York, and you should talk about that. We're, we've built this piece it, it, exactly the place you're talking about. And I think also, maybe more importantly for us as musicians, is musicians talked about where they lived and they titled the song that. And that meant that was a place to insulate yourself with your people who spoke that language and listened to that kind of music with that rhythm. So Route 66 is a route out. It ain't just a highway. It's a route out, right? Take the A train says, no, but you got to then take the A train to Harlem, <laughs> where your folk are that sound like this. A tone parallel to Harlem, Duke Ellington writes, he's talking about this is what it sounds like. So when I got to New York in the 90s, hip hop was telling me what New York City sounded like. Queens Bridge sounded like this. South Bronx sounded like this. 125th in Harlem sounded like this. Biggie told us what Brooklyn sounded like, and it told us the stories. And in the Bay, at the very same time, there, was a, there were hip-hop groups here. The hieroglyphics told me what the Bay sounded like. They told me what the slang was. They told me the places to go, the beer to drink. <laughs> you, know, like, you know what I mean? Like, they told me all that. But when we're studying music in conservatories, they don't tell you any of that. So wh where is the disconnect when we talk about the music? We don't, we're going to just talk about the, the notes on the page, and it's a disservice 
to all of those lives that got to the point where they decided these are the notes I can put on the page for you to hear and understand. And so that's really what brought us forward in looking at not only the songs that we wrote, but the kind of like the sweeping history and to pull out the quiet moments in our history too, the moments of contemplation as well as the moments of rage. I appreciate that and I have to say, I'm from Detroit, so even though this is bringing classical and jazz, I'm glad you snuck in a little Motown. <laughs> Donna, um, you were here at Berkeley. Now you're not here at Berkeley at Rutgers. Um, you shared a lot of history about the Black Panther Party. Uh, again, I'm older, I knew Huey and uh, Bobby Seals. Uh, where are we now? in terms of this great migration and the next generation. Um, you know, people don't, don't, probably don't remember this, but the Black Panther Party, one of the things they did is they put guns in the car and followed the police mm -hmm. because the black community was not safe. We were not safe from the police. And they sort of, they basically said they were gonna police the police. Mm -hmm. Where are we now? Well, I think, you know, as a historian, we always start with where we are and where we're going from where we've been. And I think the Panthers, for me, they actually opened the channel to the migration. And it was a history that could never have been written had I not been living here. Because people always talked about the Panthers from a point of distance. You know, the way the New York Times talked about the Panthers. But when I came to Oakland, the first thing I realized is that I was in the South. People were still Southern, and that even the idea of armed self-defense grew out of Bobby Seale's childhood, hunting and fishing and feeling a sense of autonomy and independence. So I think that, and one of the most amazing and powerful things about this show, from which I've learned so much, is the way that the South is an archive for all of us. And I'm not from the Bay Area. I'm actually from Western Pennsylvania, and my family is from St. Louis. But it was in Oakland and the genesis of the Panthers that I understood all of our history differently, because that is what we all share, is the South. In terms of where we are today, I think that we're at a moment of real, um, I'm looking for the right word, of paradox and also danger. So we are seeing the overturning of the Voting Rights Act. And I think that the party is so loved by young people. So the Movement for Black Lives chose Asada Shakur, a New York Panther, as their icon and use her poem from Cuba always as their refrain. And so the Panthers, like the South to me, are a living archive, but they are being used also at a moment of real peril. So whether it's questions of housing and displacement in the Bay Area, some of our migration is from Oakland to Antioch, Oakland to Stockton, but I think the most one of the most important parts of the story is also the re-migration to the South. So I think that the Panthers' vision of organizing young people and combining socialism and the deep and rich culture that black people have remains important. Thank you. And Tanya, let me ask you, uh, as a um, Cuban-American, I assume the migration story is, is different from you, but there's a, a migration story nonetheless. So how is for, is for you thinking about black migration in the United States as a Cuban American? How do, how do you relate to the story? Well, um, every participation that I have with the community is a learning lesson for me. Uh, the first lesson was given to me by the Dance Theater of Harlem and I spent the first almost 12 years of my, after my arrival in Harlem. And that's when I learned not only what the project was, which was to demonstrate that uh, people of color could dance ballet, 
um, I learned the dances, I learned the music, I learned to eat soul food. It was uh, a very interesting situation and uh, at every step I have been learning and learning and learning. And it's not different. I am uh, the product of a family of migrants from different parts of the world and uh, that happened to find each other in Cuba and decided to form a family. So every time that I hear about migration, where there is the people of color, or the people with whichever color you wanted to call it, it's like we have been migrating in this planet from day one. And uh, I don't know why, you know, uh, the respect that we should actually have for each other as human beings is, uh, is voided, you know, for the sake of power or for the sake of feeling aggrandized or something like that, which is something that uh, have created a lot of turmoil in me uh, from, from that day until now. Thank you. Yeah. I have one more question, then I'll take one question from the audience, and then I'm going to let you have the rest of your night. Um, so, two things, actually. First of all, many of you know that the first country that Nelson Mandela went to after he ended apartheid was Cuba. Uh, and black Cubans went to South Africa and fought for independence. They turned it around. Some of you may not know history. The Soviet Union was there, and the Soviet Union was getting its, bus, its butt kicked. Excuse my French. And they pulled out, left the tanks and stuff in the mud in Africa. And they sent black Cubans over there, and they turned it around. And so Nelson Mandela, as a point of recognition, when he apartheid in, one of the first places he went to was Cuba to thank the black Cubans for what they had done. So just sort of tying a little history in. We're the Othering and Belonging Institute, and what we call for is a world where everyone belongs and no one is other. Um, and Donna, you talked about the Voting Rights Act. That's not what we're seeing in this country today. Um, and so just, if you want to comment on how do we actually build a place where everybody belongs? I can tell you, my dad would not go back to the South. He was terrified. When I was 11 years old, I was forbid to go into the South because there had been a lynching, and I was upset. And it's like, you can't say anything. So now my daughter's getting ready to go back to the South, uh, and I still feel like the new South looks a whole lot like the old South. Um, Anyway, I'm going off. Um, my point is, how do we actually create a space where black people, where brown people, where Asians, where Native Americans, where white people, where everyone belongs, and people might still migrate, but they're not being forced to migrate. There's not the violence. There's not the fear. There's not the stripping people of their rights. Any thoughts about how we get there? Well, I can just say, in terms of a point of specificity, about the way our show is developed is that we believe it matters who is at the table and that when you have a show this broad there are many tables. As a performer you will never get to see all the tables it takes to invite an evening such as this to occur. But I personally feel that the performer Bastion is way too small and way too far away from almost every table that can sustain you when you are not the whole battery generating it. So I fling myself at this show, but also we've flung ourselves in meetings that some might think, oh, that's above your, right? And we are producing the show at places that are interested in seeing what a room like that looks like. We're performers who composed some of the music in the show, but it's not a show of our music. Jason wrote the 
perfect example. Jason wrote, meaning when you get a little space, you make it bigger. If you don't represent yourself, that's okay. But the person representing you, who's the next person they're really down there in the trenches for? And if you have the privilege, such as I do, you know my parents, right? So I didn't know that. My parents know a lot of people. I have a privilege. I can make mistakes. I can sing with 13 different vocal techniques just to get the feeling out and see what happens. There's nobody coming for me, and I have a bank account. I have a savings. I have lessons in finance. I have something to burn. I can afford to. When you can afford to, but you don't, in your space, I don't mean go to a march in the middle of town. I mean at your job, in your break room, on your kid's playground, then we know who we are. So we try to burn as passionately in private conversations with our friends who are like-minded as we do in public rooms and we do in boardrooms, as we do in first meetings with programs. We must have words. We are people of words. Not necessarily, we have to write everything. The oral tradition is also words. So we say 21st century. This is a 21st century woman. Tanya Leon is composing in, I think she should talk about the style, the genre of music she feels she composes in, because that's a 21st century woman. I wrote my song, I wrote the words about my parents moving here. Jason wrote Kane for the five woodwind players. He doesn't play a woodwind instrument. That's skill. And so for Cal performances and other places to give us the place to play it and put our name on it and show who's playing it, you could be surprised how, how rare that is. Why bother? Why? Why, the, why do you get, there's six people right here. Well, but no, I want these people. And tell them why. And Cal Performances backed us up in that vision. So you have a performing arts center that will do that for you. There are so many good things coming through here, but um, this is a little crazy. <laughs> so where's that space? And women of great accomplishment who will partner with what are, in that way of looking at, very young, kind of like upstart. That's kind of me. Jason is quite established. Do you understand? So try to, to invert the spaces with acknowledgement of your particular specific privilege and authenticity note, pull it forward. That's what I could say. And I think everybody here would be doing that and could teach me a lot about how to even to do it better. Because why else would you stay? But you got your own camp with your own fire cooking. You're just curious what's going on next door. So I thank you for all the work that I know the Q&A people do. You those people, and I thank you for coming. Thank you, thank you. Does anyone else wanna? We'll take one question from the audience. Uh, and I see three hands. <laughs> so why don't you both ask questions, keep them short, and then I'll let them make closing comments and then we'll be calling it a night. And tell us who you are. My name is Ricky Stevenson. I'm from Oakland, but I now live in Paris for the last 24 years. I want you to bring this to Paris. Oh. And I want to know whose idea was it? <laughs> were you in the kitchen? Were you in the bed? Were you, where were you? <laughs> when you said, let's do this. <laughs> and how long did it take? Okay, and you ask your question and then I'll answer it. Go ahead. Okay. Introduce yourself. My name is Lois Corrin. I'm a Stanford Cardinal. Top of that work. Um, but I, what I want to know is how did you get Cal to do this? Not that they haven't done things that I'm surprised about, but just, just how. Just, just how. Because I want them to have more black students coming in. I haven't, 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 I
I will repeat the question. Two questions. The first question was from a woman who's living in Paris now. She's from this area, and she wants the show to come to Paris, but she also wants to know how they thought of it. How did this originate? Um, and, uh, and again, she wants to be populated around the world. Uh, the second question was, how did they get Cal to do this? Cal is not always known for its innovation, for its open armness, and for welcoming black people. Um, sometimes, sometimes not. So those were the two questions. Well, do you know, you know, when you have this, uh, you'll see at home, there's a digital program, and there are names that we mostly all skip over, like 35 first names of whoever these people are at this place. That's why we're here. Some of those people were asked to, to do the supporting work, but the people right at the top, they get on the phone and they call you and they ask. I mean, but you have to be a strange, rare bird to be getting phone calls like that, which means that you have to be risking something so bizarre because this is not a known entity. We make it for you. It's made for you. We've done it in Chicago. We didn't talk about Black Panther's education. Young people, young my, I didn't know 90% of what was in your book. Please buy this book. The, if you, th these are just nuggets and fragments that felt romantic in the music, but there's a lot of hard truths and what you speak of a 21st century in her book, and it's very important, I think, to read. I wanted to, well, first, Jason to say, so Jeremy Geffen is your leader here. And look at the programming that he brings. We're one of these children. They curate, we come. And he divined, I don't even know if I'm allowed to say where he worked previously, but that's when we first met him. And so he's a transplant here, and he wanted us to come here. Um, and he had never seen the piece. And that's what you can do with access and privilege. I don't think I'm telling his business. I think it's in the print if we ever read that print and read his biography. Where was he? Where were we? That's where we were. You can pull people in, you can, a librarian, you buy the books. Must buy books, should buy books, you shouldn't buy those books. Maybe you can't get all of them in, but you can get one. You know, so I don't know his reasoning, but it would be wonderful to maybe interview him about that. And the idea of migration is about these big tables that we can't see. I'm just saying what I've, I mean, it's clear to me. Somebody somewhere is deciding what these national arts conversations should be. And it seems to me that every few years the subject changes and then there's a lot of funding towards these concepts and ideas. So migration, right? Migration. And then now a lot of monuments. We have a monuments piece. We're very proud of it. But that these are these deeper veins of circulating ideas and I, people ask us that, but I, I can't take any credit for that. We were asked to look at it, and I will say it was my idea that we could not begin to do this alone, and that we would need as many people as possible to approach it with even any accuracy. And there are many parts of this not examined in public, but we have examined them, and we're waiting for those invitations to tell those stories. So don't tell them what the unexamined ideas are. But they, I think they invited you. Is that what happened? So th let's be honest about access. Say, tell them. Yeah, but I also, but I don't do anything without Alicia. I, I did bad on the SAT, but I married a brilliant woman. <laughs> <laughs> I did, I did terrible on the SAT. And so I play piano for a living. And my job as a musician is to make sound for a place and it's to meet other artists who want to figure out what sound needs to be in a room. And you have to interrogate the room to get to what the sound should be. And you have to bring other people in here 
to charge the room in the way it hasn't been charged before. So if I hear Beethoven again, I don't think it's getting charged new. I don't care what the frame on it is. It's just not. So for us, we want to make sure that there is a kind of a friction between the music and the ideas that get expressed from the stage. It should not feel comfortable at some point. When we hear that quiet piece about Bobby Seale's home and we listen to a solo flute for seven minutes. Yes, you did. Yes. Think about the quietude that we as a people have to have to wake up every morning. What it takes that we are not allowed to be that quiet and make those sounds with that much tenderness and space. And space is what we desire, you know? I desire the podium. That's a small bit of real estate that Tanya stands on and wields the hand that guides us to the future, watching her, you know? That's a space. I don't take that little two square feet for granted at all. All those jazz spaces that Howard Wiley mentions tonight, those are spaces that provoke freedom, that give friction for you as a listener to walk out and agitate the public looking for solace. That's what the music does. So if we're not bringing music that does that to a room, I don't really want to hear it. And I look for conversations with Alicia to figure out how can we do this elegantly. <laughs> <laughs> and we try to find the ways and the community of people who have found the language, their own version of the language, and present that language on the stage. And you know you ain't seen it a lot, because they will tell you how we sound in a very small microscope. So when Alicia so cleverly said, this is the music of the great migration, black music in migration, it's constantly moving and changing. Every one, every year, in every location, it is shifting and it is transforming futures for people. So we believe in sound. We believe that you all take sound into your body and you take it out into the world and hopefully generate something powerful from that. We believe in sound. So that's why we also found each other, thankfully, and then we found, found ways to make, make space on the stage for these kinds of stories. Um, the book they mentioned, what's the book they mentioned? The, the book is Living for the City, Migration, Education, and the Rise of the Black Panther Party. It's University of North Carolina Press. And in response to this idea, um, the most treasured line in my book is dedicated to my mother. And I say that she taught me to value the said and the unsaid and to always listen. And tonight, what I was struck with is that in trying to reconstruct the history also of the reasons why people migrated, the traumas in families, the collective violence of Jim Crow, it's hard for people to tell these stories. And in my own family, they've not been told to me. And that's, I was just thinking about that, the unsaid. And as I was listening to the music tonight, I thought about how much of experience that parents have protected their children and grandchildren from, but black music and expression has been that voice for the unsaid and that transformation. And I felt that so deeply tonight. <laughs> 